hello, everybody, and uh, we would like to welcome you to PATH Parents, Parent, Family Voices of Connecticut's webinar series called A Guide to Supporting Youth Through Transition. This is our third um, series of five. Um, and before we start, we're just going to ask um, everybody to please mute yourselves if you're not speaking. Thank you. That'd be great. Um, so I'm Carmina Sirioli and Nancy Labogo just spoke. We're the co-executive directors for PATH, uh, Parent to Parent Family Voices. And this series will be recorded and shared to those that um, are registered. So feel free to share through the chat if you have any questions. Um, Kathleen, would you like us, and Andrew, would you like us to, when the questions come in, or do you want to wait till the end? Uh, you can you can interrupt as they come in. I think it will be good to be interrupted. As long as we keep them um, relatively general, just so we kind of keep on track with the group. And then we can answer specific questions at the end. Okay. So maybe raise your hand. Is that how you want to do it? So that we're not, nobody's jumping. We're not jumping on top of each other. Maybe raise your hand and we'll. And you'll call on them. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to do the raise hand feature on my phone. I'm gonna maybe figure out. that one out. <laughs> All right. So um, as I said, this is the third session of the five-part series. Um, tonight we're talking about financial independence, money management, the ABLE accounts. The next session will be August 26th on employment, self-directed employment, customized employment, and small business ownership. And on September 30th will be post-secondary <clears throat> and higher education. And um, I just want to add, Carmina, um, yeah. those last two presentations are going to be um, conducted by Dr. Linda Randler, if um, anybody knows her um, here in Connecticut. She, she works for the USAID, um, but she is um, one of the gurus of, in the world of transition. Um, particularly in the post-education, the Think College, if you've heard that term before, um, and also customized employment. So it'll be a real, real treat. So just to go over a couple of things in case uh, some that are on this webinar haven't heard of who we are. Uh, we are a free statewide grassroots parent organization. We are dedicated to offering emotional and informational support to families of children with um, special health care needs. We offer um, quite a few services as we have listed here. The heart of our program is our listener program, the one-to-one -one matching service. Uh, who better to talk to than someone that's already walked the walk and understands what you're going through. We have the Connecticut Family to Family Health Information Center. We have um, staff available to help families navigate the healthcare system and state um, agency, any questions that they may have, um, making sure that their child is getting the appropriate services that they need. We also offer our Kids as Self Advocates. It's a youth leadership and advocacy Hello. organization. It's for 13 to 26. They meet once a month. Um, and it's a great group of kids, um, array of disabilities. Everybody is welcome. Um, at the moment, we're doing it via Zoom. So if you have a child between those ages and you'd like to participate, feel free to. Can everybody put their cell phones on mute, please? Um, thank you. Um, then we also have a sibling everybody leadership put network. Everybody yourself on mute. Do I have to do that? Everybody. Um, we have chart in the life course, uh, general, we have, um, genetic resources and advocacy that we, uh, provide families. We also have a special education advocate on, on staff, monthly newsletter, speaker programs, and trainings that we offer. So if you'd like more information on our services, feel free to email us, um, but let me see. If, again, if anybody, if everybody can put themselves on mute, that would be wonderful. We'd appreciate that. Um, so with no further ado, let us introduce our speakers for tonight. Uh, we have Kathleen Hayes, attorney Kathleen Hayes. Um, Nancy, would you like to introduce her? 
There she is. Am I on mute? Um, no, you're not on mute. Please mute yourself. And just a reminder to everybody else to please mute so we don't have any background um, disturbance. Thank you so much. Um, Kathleen, uh, oh my gosh, I keep messing up your name. Your new married name. We need to change that, Carmina. Thank oh, you. Yes, I have it changed on know. my page. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks, Carm. You need to change it on yours. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, is an attorney and co-founding member of the Hartford-based law firm Disability Planning Partners, Kathleen focuses her practice on serving elders and individuals with disabilities of all ages and levels of need. Within her work, she places a special emphasis on planning for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. This work is driven by a pas personal passion, Kathleen's relationship um, with her uncle Danny, who, was an, who has an intellectual disability. Kathleen's uncle Danny formed her heart for advocacy. She taught her not only the beauty of disability, but also the incredible vulnerability, stress, and fear that families carry as they try to navigate a complex system that seems to plummet before every peak. Um, and as we know, um, Kathleen's bio goes on and on and on because she's a wealth um, of information. Um, and if you've attended any of our past presentations, you'll know that she really does know her stuff. And we're really thankful um, that she's able to, um, she's been able to guide us through this series. Thank you. Thank you. And our next presenter is um, Andrew Camaro, is a certified financial planner and the founder of Planning Across the Spectrum. Andrew specializes in helping any self-advocating client or family with or without autism and intellectual disabilities achieve financial security. He provides expert guidance for life decisions that are either unknown, not easily accessible, or can be compl complicated to pilot for someone with special needs. Andrew provides a unique perspective for those with special needs, their caregivers and their families because he has walked in their shoes having received his autism diagnosis late in life. Andrew is a passionate advocate for autism awareness and has educated himself in everything possible to help with underserved autism community. In addition to his CFP uh, designation, Andrew holds a master's degree in financial services and is certified and is a certified behavioral financial advisor, chartered special needs consultant and associate estate planner. Andrew sits on the boards for Autism Services and Resources Connecticut, the American College Alumni, and the Focus Center for Autism. He is a Connecticut House of Representatives Autism Spectrum Disorder Advisory Council appointee and frequently speaks on his own experiences or on various financial and insurance planning topics. Thank you both for joining us today. Uh, we're so excited to learn about these topics. Um, okay. I made you both co-hosts, so you should be able to take it away. <laughs> right. So I think Andrew's got this under control, and I'll kick us off, and then we'll get going. All right. It's always, always so great when technology works. Okay, so um, I just wanted to give an overview of our intent in the presentation. Um, Andrew and I frequently partner together because uh, we share the same philosophy in terms of our practices, which is empowering individuals uh, with disabilities and giving them as much of a voice and as much independence as possible. And that seems to really be the theme of what uh, PATH has been um, endeavoring to promote with, within this series. So tonight, um, I think Andrew is so well positioned to cover this topic. He shared um, this presentation with me at one point uh, when we first started working together a couple years ago. And you know, just to give him a little bit of, of praise because he won't do it himself. It was such a unique view. I thought of, uh, it was a presentation I'd never seen before um, for individuals in terms of how to manage your money and really thinking about 
money management and budgeting from a young age and setting yourself up for as much independence and success as is possible for each individual. Um, so Andrew is going to take it away with regard to financial management, um, his overview, and then in the second half of the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about how um, ABLE accounts, what they are and how they factor into uh, the, fin the financial success of an individual with a disability. Thank you, Kathleen. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So, and I, I like questions and like comments and interruptions along the way if people raise their hand. I can't speak for Kathleen, except that I interrupt her a lot. I don't know whether she likes it or not. Yeah. Um, so again, why are we here? So we're going to just talk about, again, basic uh, banking and money concepts. Um, and I don't really think there's any, there aren't very many people who love this topic. It's something that really should be taught to everyone. It's not taught to anyone. It's especially important for individuals with disabilities. You can't be independent if you can't manage money. It's a requirement, right? Um, so I want to go over just, again, some really basic stuff. I, I don't want to talk in language that's going to confuse and complicated terms. I can if somebody wants me to. But if you can't explain it simply, I don't think you understand it well enough. So I, I really want to break it down a little bit simple and, you know, what's important. So hopefully it's not, you know, too basic, but it's a little, you know, informative uh, as well. So this is, again, it, it sounds a little silly, but I, what's important with selecting a bank? So because... Ideally, you should have a bank. There, there are alternatives to not having a bank. But what I find especially important is the, these low fees, uh, or sorry, these low account fees if you don't have $50,000, or just fees for all of these little things. Raise your hand if you use Bank of America, because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and you want to avoid those as much as possible. And what I find is it's a, usually a good small community bank, uh, credit unions. Yes, things like interest rates matter, but generally speaking, especially now, interest rates are about zero anyway. So it's really, you know, is there a bank close to you? Do they have good online access? Almost all of them are really going to have the same insurance, be the same security. But the online tools matter as well. Being able to take a picture of a check and deposit it, being able to go to any ATM without fees, and having it where if you have a $20 balance that you're not going to get hit with a, a $30 fee for that month, right? You, you don't want the bank account to cost you a lot of money. So... I, I recommend a, a few, there's some online only banks uh, such as, you know, Capital One 360 or a lot of local credit unions or smaller banks are usually um, have a, a simple checking account. You don't need to put much in and there's no minimum maintenance fees. So, so that's the biggest thing I'd, I'd look at. There are ATM and transaction fees most banks have them, some don't. So selecting a bank that has either free ATM, be able to take money if you need it, be able ease of use. So, and you don't need five bank accounts, right? Just, you know, having one is usually enough. So there are, uh, different types of bank accounts. There's a savings account and a checking account. Um, I will talk about a savings account, but currently interest rates are so low, you're going to make the essentially the same, whether it's in a savings account or a checking account. This isn't normal. Um, this is not normally how things work, but I would strongly recommend just having one checking account um, to make life easier, you're not really going to get interest anyway. 
Uh, some checking accounts do offer interest. They are usually, again, free to use. Bank of America customers, once again, I apologize for you. Um, they have online tools to be able to pay bills. You can send checks directly, you know, to someone similar to either, you know, PayPal or you get the bill online. I have it where my electric bill, which, well, that's not nice this month, I think for anyone, but, you know, I actually, through my bank, I see the bill and it will automatically every month, you know, make sure that the bill is paid on the due date. I can adjust it. But it's really nice to know that if I didn't do something, that the bill would be paid. They usually come with a debit card, which is also a credit card. And one thing to also keep in mind that I actually don't think is on this slide or that I need to add a slide, but it's super important, is everyone on this call should have a credit card. If you don't, you should get one. And what I recommend is uh, get one at a store you use or Amazon or something and just have the balance paid out every month through your checking account. Why is a financial planner who's telling you to save getting you a credit, saying get a credit card? Because when it comes to a credit score, what matters more than anything else is the length of time you've had your accounts. So the earlier you can start and get a very simple credit card, even if it's $200 limit and you just put Netflix on it every month, the Netflix is automatically paid. That will do so much for your future. When you are applying for a job and an apartment, even car or rental or homeowner's insurance, they are all checking your credit report and they're giving you a rate in your worthiness based upon that. So it's, if there's one thing, if the most important thing that I'm going to talk about on this call, if you could have a takeaway is that, is hey, Don, if you don't you back? have a credit card, you absolutely should get one. And again, just put Netflix on it, have Netflix pay every month out of your other bank account. You can even cut up the card after that but establish some credit worthiness. I'm gonna skip over savings accounts a little bit. If you have one, that's great. You don't need to close it. However, it really is, sorry, muting that. Um, it really is not paying any more interest than a checking account these days. So although you might hear putting it in a savings account, I think it's easier to manage having one checking account. You could think of an ABLE account as a savings account, something that we'll talk about later. So, but generally speaking, uh, you're really just going to want a checking account these days. So, I have a question. Andrew, no, there you go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to ask you. I'm like, I. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was just wondering how young should you be to start establishing a credit history? Because I like the simple thing as, you know, even Netflix can help you establish The day a you turn 18. Oh, okay, perfect. Because the, the biggest thing that matters with a credit score is the length of time you've had a credit, you know, you've had credit. So if you start at 18, you know, your credit score is gonna be, you know, it's going to get up there that much quicker, right? And you might have to start with a card where you need to give them, it's called a secure card. I was Capital. just going to ask that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank that's you. Now, I find like Amazon's usually pretty easy to approve or a store that you might shop at. And again, with these small ones, make the balance automatically paid through your checking account. So you don't even have to worry about paying the bill. Um, and then... I would strongly suggest, so there's what's called a secure card where you have to, I know this sounds silly, you have to give them $100 to be able to spend $200. You do this to establish credit. It's not a good deal. Um, Capital One, I recommend because after 
uh, a couple of years, they'll actually usually change you to a regular credit card without needing to reapply and establish a new one from the quote secure card. Um, and Capital One has a good online bank too. So they would be my go-to recommendation outside of you know a store card or a credit card. Thank you. There's one more question here. It says, does the bank debit card slash credit card um, count towards your credit score? The banks do not. That, that's a great question. So you can use it like a credit card, but if it comes out directly through your account, then it does not count. A great example would be Target has a debit card option that comes right out of your bank account, and they have a credit card option. Um, we actually have the debit card option, um, and it's the same rate. It was just one less bill to pay. We already had several credit cards, but what you want to do is you, you want to have it still, again, automatically pay the balance in full every month. You want to use the credit card as a tool, so it's, you don't want to you know, build up a large balance, not be able to pay it. Again, that's why I, I really like just the Netflix and cut it up. So, any other Thank questions? Uh, no, someone can't see the slides. Can everyone um, else? I can. Um, does everybody else can? I actually just lost them. I have a black, oh, there they are, thanks. Okay. I don't have them at all. You still don't have them? Hmm. They're, they're not too exciting anyway. I'm, I'm, <laughs> if you're just listening, I, I think you're probably fine. I don't even know if listening is that exciting. So <laughs> I'll, make sure to po I'll make sure to point out everything. So. And it is recorded. So I'll make sure everybody that's in attendance Thank will you. get a copy so you can hear them all over again and you'll see the slides. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. And we'll put on our YouTube channel if you send me the video after, too. Oh, so, awesome. Okay, great. Yeah. Which has a lot of other good info, by the way. Uh, plug. Okay. Um, so financial stress. Everyone's, you know, stresses in general um, and anxiety. And, you know, money is a large cause of anxiety. And how to, again, eliminate some financial stress? I understand that some things are simply not helpful. If you have a lot of debt, saying that you should never have gotten debt in the first place doesn't really help you feel better right now. So we're not, you know, we're not, yes, we can help with that, but that's not what we're looking for, right? We're just looking for just some very simple things because, you know, if you say you're going to, do this budget every month and write everything out, you're probably not going to. I'm a financial planner. I help people budget. I don't have a written budget every month that I follow. So if I'm not doing it, chances are you're just not going to. Um, so just, again, making something repeatable and to keep doing it. However, it is important to establish, you know, how much you're making, and what your fixed bills are. So, so that is a simple budget and I have an example. And you can, again, make a list of all your main monthly expenses. You know, it, Kate, you know, there's certain things that I say are a minimum, right? I mean, you need to pay where you need to live, you need to eat, you know, you need, you know, cell phone, internet. There, there's right down the list of things where you absolutely need those every month. Those you can total up, and then you can total up how much you're getting. And that difference, now you may be like, well, where did the difference go? What did I spend it on? So we'll get into that in a moment. But just, you know, and if you notice that you're, you know, spending as much as you're taking in or even more, well, then it's time to reduce. You know, then that's harder because you're trying to reduce the spending that you, you know, you can't live without, right? So there's only so many things you can eliminate. We, we can't survive on nothing. So I, I think it's very important to automate savings. 
again, just like automatically paying the credit card. Um, you can have, if you get paid uh, a check or a social security payment on a certain day of the month, every month or day of the week, if you do have a separate savings account or even better, an ABLE account, which we'll mention later, it's great to just have that automated. If you don't think about it, then you probably won't miss it. So it, for example, if you have a retirement plan through work or, and it's taken out of your paycheck or all the taxes taken out of your paycheck, you know, it, you don't miss it if you never had it. So it's also really important to account for fun, right? You want to be able to do things that you actually want to do. I feel like just saving for some indefinite expense like retirement, right? So Kathleen and I have a long ways to go, you know, before we could ever think about retiring for longer than we've actually been alive, right, Kathleen? Well, I mean, you're not retiring early. So, you know, what I find is, Think about a more like short-term goal as well. You know, thinking, well, I'm not going to use this money for 30 years. That That's the complete opposite of fun. But, you know, some things, uh, for example, I know it's someone saving, you know, for, you know, like a, a therapy dog or, you know, a TV or a computer or, you know, a, a, a let's call it a major purchase, but again, something that's fun that you're like, a, that you want to save for, that you'll look forward to having. So this is a good general rule of thumb, um, and it's called a 50-30-20. Now, again, it's not always possible for everyone. It's, this is, if you could accomplish this, it's great. Don't feel bad if you can't. You know, everything's, you know, hard. There's things that come up. But if you can try to get close to this, it's a good rule. And that's if half your income can cover your basic needs. So if you are getting 1000 a month, then you can cover your expenses on 500 so Then the, and a, then $300 a month, so 30%, can be, things that you want, you know, that can be dinner, gifts, travel, entertainment, subscriptions. I would argue Netflix is probably more a need than a want these days, but there, there's a few that are in there, right? But again, dinner's out, uh, gifts, travel. So if you use a thousand a month, you know, 500 is what you need to get by and you can have 300 for fun things. And ideally, 20% is for savings and either paying down debt. Now, it's commonly called an emergency fund. However, I don't like calling it that. If you ask me why it's on my slide, if I don't like calling it that, I don't have a good answer. But, you know, don't feel that the savings account is only for, you know, emergencies. It is. On one hand, you don't want to touch it. But on the other hand, it's there for when you need it. Think of it just, again, it's savings for when you need it. Don't feel guilty about needing, you know, to go to what you might consider an emergency fund, right? So, for example, um, I had someone who had to put, dip into an emergency fund because he needed a car. Well, that's exactly what they're there for, right? So, sometimes it can be good with this savings account, again, to call it a savings account, not an emergency fund, but to have it earmarked in mind, you know, you probably, you, there's going to be things that you're never going to plan on, but there's also things that you'll plan on maybe eventually happening, right? You, things will come up and I have no idea what they'll be, but I promise you there will be other things. And again, it can also be used to paying down debt. This is just a goal. I don't expect anyone to live by it, you know, perfectly. But if you could get close, it's a good rule. So I, I, this is just, I'm going to skip this because it's a negative statistic. It says people don't save enough. Okay. Uh, <laughs> again, save, you know, save your tax refunds. 
Um, you know, don't just spend it right away. It's, there's two parts. There's the, you know, it, a lot of times too, if you keep a lot of cash, I don't know about anyone else. If I have cash in my wallet, I'm going to spend it. But if it's in my bank or on a debit card, I don't spend it as much. So you may be the opposite though. So just thinking about a lot of it is habits and what you might do with it. Keep your change. One in five dollar bills add up quickly. And again, transfer money. Again, I say savings account, but in for the purposes of this call, I think able account is, is really what we're you know meaning instead of a, a savings account. We could talk about that more later. But don't just if you've got some unemployment money from this six hundred dollars a week. And maybe Kathleen will go into that in a little bit. You know, if you don't just spend it all, you'll you'll need some later for something. There will always be something to come up, but don't just spend it on boring things. So the next couple are a little fun. Um, and this is a little bit about cutting expenses. This is more about me being Jewish and wanting to like cut costs <laughs> and being cheap <laughs> than, than trying, trying to say, oh, you're spending too much money. That, that's not helpful. But there are things that you can do without depriving yourself. So take a look at your bank statement every month and see what expenses there are. And sometimes you might be like, oh, do I really even need that anymore? Why am I paying for that? And sometimes, you know, and I'm, we're not here to say that you spend too much on Starbucks and too much on coffee, right? I, I, I never tell anyone that except my wife. Um, but realistically, I, I don't tell anyone because, you know, we, we need coffee. We need caffeine. But there's things that you could negotiate. You can call Xfinity, Comcast, your cable bill, and you could ask to lower the rate. You can, you know, your electrical bill. So look at your current bills first and see if there's a way to have those rates reduced without cutting something that you're using. Maybe you don't use cable. Maybe you can use an antenna and again, and or Netflix. Um, and again, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, no. but I was just laughing at your antenna. <laughs> Um, and again, yeah, what are you using? Or, you know, there, there are definitely, you, you know, lots of little things add up. And it's not so much the one time little purchases. It's the, you know, the, the ongoing purchases. If you are concerned about your Starbucks habit, um, then I would suggest using the app and only loading so much money a month on it. So that way, if you do run out for the month, well, then you ran out, right? So that, that might be a good way to, to limit that. Starbucks has a great on your phone, or again, you could buy a gift card for the month, right? And know that you're only going to spend that gift card. And when that gift card is out, that you're done for the month, Realistically, I don't think almost anyone wants to do that. But if you want it, I think it's a good thing to do. But it's really important to make whatever you're doing repeatable and to make a good habit and to keep doing it. So if you like the idea of just loading $50 on the Starbucks app every month, I think that's great. But you don't want to do something that in a couple months, you know, you're just not going to do again, right? It's better to take really small steps and to keep doing them. As I mentioned, I'm Jewish, so use coupons, right? Um, <laughs> Kathleen. But, you know, there, it, so there's lots with groceries, especially, you can look at coupons. Uh, the internet makes this a lot easier. And there's also services that will give you cash back has anyone ever used Ebates? Okay, so essentially, if you buy things online, which everyone does, they'll give you money for buying what you were gonna buy anyway. 
I, I won't get into now how they do that, but it is legitimate. And there's they a did. couple. I other... got money back for that. Yep. I actually did it. Yeah, I, I thought it was. Yeah, I didn't think really? it was real, but I, oh, I I'm did. So skeptical. Yeah. No, the, the way I did. It, okay, I will tell you the way it works. So what <laughs> happens is, <laughs> like Macy's will pay a company for sending people to their site. And they'll, what they do is they pay a commission to, let's say, this website for sending customers to Macy's. What, like, Ebates does is they give almost all that money back to you. So they say Macy's was going to pay us 10% of what you bought, but, you know, we're going to give you nine. So we're making one because we're not, you know, so, so that's how they, they do it. It is very legitimate. There are ones where you can just take a, a picture of your receipt from a grocery store um, and you get price and you get uh, cash back. Ebates, now called something else, Rakatoon. Um, and so there's, you know, just when you buy something online, it'll let you know, you can click. And if you're going to buy it anyway, well, there you go. Price matching. Uh, Best Buy is my favorite example because they'll price match anything on Amazon, for example, as long as it's sold by Amazon. So I remember they had something, I think it was overpriced by mistake, but I needed it that day. It was $80. Amazon had it for nine. So they gave it to me for $9, right? They, they price matched it. It was probably worth about nine. I think they, they had a mistake, but it was a big adjustment. So if you are going to, and I don't know, I noticed my typo with Hope Depot. I, that's definitely Home Depot. Um, but you really want to, you know, just if you're going to a store and buying something, um, they might price match other places other than Amazon, but most of them, if they price match, do price match Amazon. Um, just check it before you buy it. They'll adjust it. And again, you're getting the exact same thing for less. You're not limiting what you can do or what you can buy. Avoid scams. This sounds really easy. Um, and to some extent, it, there's some basic things. If it looks off, it probably is. If you have to think about whether it's legitimate, it's probably not. You could take a better look. Don't, nobody will ever ask you for your password, right? You can, for example, Gmail, most people probably use for their email, is pretty good about saying whether it's, you know, a verified company or not. You'll usually get a link to click if you get, hey, reset your password and you click and you need to enter your new password, right? Um, then that is, you know, a common technique. One thing I really want to point out is I have a lot of clients, they're, they're mostly older clients, um, who say, I don't want to do anything online because hackers will get at it and be able to see the information. It's actually the complete opposite because if you don't have an online account and I know your information, I can register an online account for you, have it go to my email, and then you also won't know until the end of the month or if you go to the bank what I've done. If you register online, then nobody else can register for you, and you can set up to get alerts if something happens, if there is an unauthorized transaction. So being able to have online access is actually the most important thing you can do to avoid scams, because then you can more quickly see an unauthorized purchase and you're preventing somebody else from registering your account online for you. Um, do not respond to calls asking for remote access to a computer. Uh, really don't respond to anyone who calls you. I mean, who actually calls people anymore to begin with? Um, I just let it go to voicemail. I don't even listen to my voicemails. Kathleen, I think if you, do I ever listen to your voicemails? Do you even leave them for me? I don't so, leave, I know better. Okay, see? <laughs> so, 
You guys are millennials. <laughs> <laughs> it's a so, different generation. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but it, and it is true. Um, but so one thing too is even if you're saying, be careful of really anyone calling you for kind of anything and giving any information away, even if you think it's legitimate. So for example, um, I'm going to, let me pick on somebody who, who's not Kathleen. Uh, Carmina, were you, um, so I should have said 80, right? But sorry, my, my you know, or, you know, 1990, right? So. Yeah, it okay. would have been really good, yeah. I know, I should have, yeah. but okay. Yeah. And then if I know the last four, I have your social security number, right? I was pretty close. Interesting, that's very so interesting. So be very careful um, about that. So that's a common um, mm -hmm scam that people use mm -hmm. and you think you're wow. not giving away as much information as you are wow. social security wow. did change that so for for younger people uh so my daughter was born three years ago hers isn't following that rule because they realized it was easy for everyone to guess so wow. um also when it comes to and by the way it's the first time i had done that game on a webinar so i apologize uh <laughs> And it was recorded, Carmina. Perfect. I know. The, uh, that's getting deleted. <laughs> but, well, but you didn't give me anything that I couldn't, I could, you could do the same thing anyone else on the call, right? Uh, it's so, not me, though, because I'm an immigrant. So mine, you, your, your, your logic wouldn't work on me. You're, you are, well, it's where you got your social, yep. right? Yeah. So if, so, um, so some, so some, uh, not everyone was given their social when they were, you know, born. Uh, if you immigrated, it, it depends, right? Sometimes I've seen it where you got your first job. Sometimes I've seen it uh, otherwise, like uh, Barack Obama had a Connecticut social security number. Um, so anyway, so use, you know, hard to guess passwords in a password manager. There's lots of free ones. So what they do is if you can remember one password, it'll fill in all your other passwords for you. So it's because if they get access to one pat, you may say, think, I, I have a really complicated Netflix password. And anytime we get like a new Roku or it's logging in somewhere, my wife screams at me because it takes us like five minutes to put in the Netflix password. It's just Netflix. I say yes, but if somebody got access to Netflix, then they could get access to everything else because it's all the same password. And you don't have to remember them all. You can use a password manager. There's software. A lot of it's built into you know, your internet browser. And that can be a great way to uh, be actually more secure is saving your passwords. So. Now that Andrew has sufficiently frightened everybody. <laughs> So let me just say I'm not dropping off the call because his his comedic timing tonight is really superb. <laughs> so I'm glad that you know we've got some levity. Um, so we're going to talk about programs and services that may help your budget. So this is not a public benefits um, presentation. We could obviously spend plenty of time diving into detail on these benefits, but it is important to understand what's out there and have some foundational benefits in mind because they can really help to either increase your uh, actual income, for example, social security benefits, uh, your income and assets over time, but also they can help you to save your assets because if public benefits are paying for services that you need, then you're saving yourself the expense of the out-of-pocket payment. So you are in fact preserving your, your finances by properly accessing and knowing about everything that's available to you. So you can go to the next slide. So just a very brief overview, what are public benefits? We hear this term all the time. There are supports and services that are provided by the state and or the federal government for individuals, uh, and in this case, we're talking about those for individuals with disabilities. Um, some of these programs provide a cash benefit, like Social Security, and we'll talk a little bit about that 
while others provide services like DDS um, programming, for example. Most public benefit um, programs are going to require that individuals have very low resources in order to qualify. So that means low income and that means low assets. And we can talk a little bit more about some specific limits to keep in mind. But I like to talk about public benefits in connection with ABLE accounts and, and special needs trusts, so we're not covering those tonight because the idea behind all of these um, tools behind ABLE accounts and special needs trusts is a recognition that people with disabilities have disability related needs, but they also have life needs. We have to pay our rent, you need to buy groceries, um, you need to go have fun, you need your Starbucks coffee. Um, and so the government stepped back and said, if we're asking people that have not only everyday needs, but also disability related needs, if we're asking them not to have any money to get the programs and services that they need, how aren't we bankrupting these individuals and causing them to be totally impoverished and unable to meet their other expenses and therefore further reliant upon the government? And so the idea is let's create vehicles that will allow people with disabilities to keep money, keep resources for these other needs uh, while still accessing the benefits and services that they need. That's the whole idea underlying public benefits and the tools that allow you to meet these low limits. So um, next slide, please. Okay, ever so briefly, the, I want to mention these cash benefits because over time, it's incredible how they can accumulate. So SSI, we say you apply generally at age 18 because that's when your money is legally separated from your parents. So that's typically when somebody's going to meet the low financial limit of $2,000, unless, of course, you have extra money that is invisible in an ABLE account or a special needs trust. And in order to get SSI, you need to have a disability that's impacting your ability to work in some way. Um, doesn't mean you can't work, it just means that there's some impact. Um, and $2,000 or less, not counting the things in an ABLE counter or special needs trust. If you meet that eligibility criteria, then you get a maximum monthly benefit of 783. Um, and I did put there as a strategy, you might want to put a rental agreement in place because for people that are living and receiving free room and board, that benefit's going to be reduced by a third. Um, so 783 a month over um, the course of a year is about $9,000 and over the course of 10 years, $93,000. So of course you're gonna be using some of that, but the idea is if you're, um, thinking about your social security more globally, you really realize the importance of applying as soon as you can because this is the ability to start really saving for yourself. Um, social security disability insurance typically is a full replacement of SSI, although some people can have both at the same time. And this is a really critical benefit because it not only um, allows the individual to get more than 783 a month, but also after two years of being on social security disability, somebody's eligible, the person is eligible for Medicare. And we all know that the, some of the most expensive um, costs out there are medical costs. And Medicare is an excellent insurance to have in addition to um, Medicaid or in addition to a private insurance. So the way to get SSDI is either through your own work record. There's some uh, little tricky rules about how long you have to work and how much you need to pay into the system. But presuming somebody works enough, you get a, an entitlement check, meaning you earned this, you paid into the system every month that doesn't actually have any resource limits to it, no strings attached. The other way to get SSDI is through a parent. If an individual with a disability 
um, had that disability before the age of 22, which is why I also tell families apply at age 18, not only to get a $783 benefit, uh, and I'm saying apply for SSI at age 18, but also to establish yourself in the social security system as having a disability before 22, so that down the line, if you have a parent that retires, leaves work due to their own disability or passes away, that child will get a portion of that parent's benefit without reducing what the parent gets. So for example, um, if I have a disability before the age of 22 and my dad retires and he gets $2,000 a month from Social Security retirement, I'm gonna get $1,000 a month. He's still gonna get his 2,000, but I get $1,000 a month. Um, and if my dad leaves work due to a disability, same thing, 50% of his record. When he passes away, I get 75% of what he once received. So I tell families about this, um, even if, when parents are far from retirement, because again, it's all about knowing about what's out there and accessing these benefits soon so that you don't lose out on what can ultimately accumulate and really have a big benefit in the long term. Okay. Service related benefits. I'm not going to spend much time here. The idea is that there are benefits out there that link you to services. And I think we all are generally aware of services through the Department of Developmental Services, um, the autism waiver, um, community first choice for people that need hands on assistance. Um, generally speaking, these services are accessed through Medicaid Husky C. And in order to access Medicaid Husky C, an individual has to have $1,600 or less if they're not working, um, $10,000 plus retirement accounts of any value if they are working, and income within the limit of $23.49 a month or less. If you're working, that gets bumped up so that you can make $75,000 a year. So I will say here, and I know this is, I'm going quickly because I wanna make sure we get to the ABLE account portion, but the takeaway here is that uh, when somebody, and I really like working with Andrew in this regard too, because there is a lot of fear, I think, around financial security and benefits. And so what I think Andrew has done in his first portion of the presentation is kind of demystified finances and budgeting and um, maybe through understanding that people have a little less fear and a little more empowerment and less fear in terms of what happens if I lose my social security. So part of benefit planning Benefits are there to support an individual as a safety net. Typically speaking, these cash benefits that I've been speaking about are supplementing wages. They're standing in the place of wages that the individual may not otherwise be able to earn. But if an individual can earn money, there is an analysis to be done and something that Andrew and I can assist with to step back and say, hey, if I really can earn this certain level, yes, these benefits may go away, but look at what I get. So I'll give you an example. Um, somebody that's on uh, SSI might be receiving 783 a month, and that individual uh, might get employed and do very well at a job and um, say that they want to limit their earnings because they're worried that they're going to lose entirely their SSI. But I look then at Medicaid services and well, hey, you might lose your SSI, but look, you get to keep $10,000 outside of an ABLE account. So you can have even more than that. You can start saving and earning um, money in retirement accounts that will always be exempt throughout your entire life, even if you stop working due to your disability or due to retirement. Um, and you get a much higher income cap earning limit so that you can have 75,000 a year. 
So this isn't the case for everybody, but it certainly opens people's eyes. And the, the goal is to make people aware that you can have financial security and still access public benefits. Um, it's all about being intentional and you can't be intentional unless you're informed. And so that's our, our goal is to be here to keep you informed and help you to evaluate the options as they arise. We can move on. All right, so ABLE accounts. Um, Andrew and I have done a couple of presentations, or more than a couple actually, on ABLE accounts. Um, and, and our goal is really to make sure that people are aware of these, uh, are aware of what ABLE accounts are, are aware of how easy they actually are to access and use, and are further aware of what a huge benefit they are to individuals in, in terms of saving and, and even earning interest that is not going to be taxable income. So when ABLE, ABLE accounts came into existence back in 2014 as a matter of federal law. So basically what happened is Congress said, we wanna create a legal tool for people with disabilities. And those disabilities had to have started before the age of 26. It's a crazy age. We want the age limit to go away, but that's what we have at this point in time. And we as Congress want these individuals to, number one, be able to save money um, and still be able to access public benefits. So th this account for all intents and purposes will be invisible. And we also want the individual to be able to access and manage that money themselves. And that was the, a really critical piece of ABLE accounts because before ABLE accounts came into existence, an individual with a disability could save their money and, and it would be invisible, but the only tool that existed at that time was a first party special needs trust. And one of the keys of that first party special needs trust is that the individual with a disability can't touch the money can't control the money, it has to be controlled by a trustee. So ABLE accounts stepped in and said, there's a lot of value and benefit to individuals being able to manage their own money. It's, it's so important to an individual's self-esteem and to their quality of life. Um, and, and so hence ABLE accounts got a lot of traction within the disability community and ultimately came into law. Now, the federal law basically said, okay, you states can go ahead and open ABLE programs through your Department of Treasury. So an ABLE account is not, a, is not an account that you can go to Bank of America or go to your credit union and say, I'd like to open an ABLE account. Rather, much like a 529 college savings program, every state manages its own program. Now, Connecticut is behind the eight ball, and we are one of the last states to, to kind of get on the train. Um, although, before the COVID um, outbreak, Connecticut was looking at asking other states to, hey, propose your program to us and maybe we'll adopt it. Um, and Ohio was actually one of those programs that kind of came in to be considered. And we have a lot of nice things to say about Ohio, and we can talk about why a little bit later. Um, but from the outset, I want to be clear, Connecticut doesn't have its own program, but the federal law said that doesn't matter. Other states can open their accounts to out-of-state residents. And because we're doing so much with online banking, it doesn't really matter what state you're, you choose, even, even proximity-wise to Connecticut. Um, all ABLE programs have to follow the same rules that I'm going to go through here. The difference is kind of like what Andrew was saying in terms of how to choose a bank. What are the interests, or I'm sorry, what are the um, fees? Are there minimum balances? Um, who actually manages the money? There's different investment advisors um, that each state has selected. So for example, Funds in the Ohio ABLE account are managed by Vanguard. Those in Massachusetts are managed by Fidelity. So those are the types of things that you're looking at when you're thinking about what makes these programs different. Debit card access, how, what is the online tracking of expenses? How, how well is that, um, how user-friendly is that? Um, 
So what we know so far is that ABLE accounts exist in virtually all states, not Connecticut, but we can access as Connecticut residents virtually any state's ABLE account because many of them are open to out-of-state residents. And you have to have a disability before the age of 26. So the way that this works is that an individual with a disability can contribute their own money to the ABLE account. And it's a tax advantaged account, meaning that contributions to that account are going to be invested. I mentioned Vanguard and Fidelity, and there's going to be a growth in that account that will not be taxed as income. And likewise, when the money comes out, as long as it's used in the right way, those distributions are not taxed as income. So this is a, um, a wonderful way for an individual to be able to save and accumulate funds with a tax benefit. Um, there are, uh, in addition to the individual with a disability being able to contribute, other people can contribute to the ABLE account as well. I always caveat that though, um, and I put it on the slide, that it's not recommended that an ABLE account be used to receive an inheritance because that's really where we put our emphasis on a third party special needs trust. And again, tonight we can't get into all the ins and outs of that, um, but one of the main, two of the main reasons are Number one, when you have an ABLE account, there are annual contribution limits. And right now in 2020, that limit is $15,000. So that means that I, as someone with a disability, can contribute money um, and my mom and my grandparent can all contribute. But at the end of the year, all of our contributions can't go over 15,000. Um, <clears throat> So there's um, other people can contribute, but there's contribution caps. Um, once the funds are in the ABLE account, how do they come out? Well, they come out for the sole benefit of that individual with a disability for disability related expenses. Um, and those expenses, Andrew, do you wanna to jump to the next slide and I'll have you jump back? While he's doing that, can I ask a question please? Oh, sure. Um, so if, if you're limited to 20,000, um, or maybe you're going to answer this next, um, can you take out some and then keep contributing? Like let's say somebody wanted to take it out and put it under their pillow. No, so in a, in a calendar year from January to December 31st, all of the deposits in cannot exceed 15,000. So it's not that the balance can't exceed 15,000, it's that everything that goes in can't be more than 15,000. But I will also mention that if somebody is working, they, the law does allow that person to contribute um, a maximum of about 12,000 additional dollars each year. Um, there's some rules surrounding that in terms of whether they're contributing to uh, an, an employer-sponsored retirement plan. Um, but yes, to answer your question, um, unfortunately, you can't withdraw to add more. But as soon as January 1st comes in the next year, you can uh, start over again. Um, in an ABLE account, all of the money is going to be exempt for public benefits, like SSI, Medicaid, um, other benefits that we haven't touched on are food stamps, energy assistance, rental assistance. It's exempt for the purpose of all of those programs. Um, and for SSI, it's exempt up to $100,000. So it's gonna take a while for someone to get to 100,000 because you can only put in 15,000 a year. Um, after $100,000, Social Security says, no more, we're only going to disregard the first 100,000. Um, so the way that the money is used once it's in there is for the sole benefit of that person with a disability or for their primary enjoyment. Um, and it has to be for disability related expenses. Now, disability related expenses, Andrew and I basically say, 
as long as it's for the individual, anybody can make a connection to disability. Mental health, emotional health, physical health, all of those things when you're going on vacation or you're um, purchasing clothing that makes you feel good about yourself, you're using transportation, you're paying for a cell phone that you need for communication um, and safety. All of those things can be related to your disability in some way or another. Um, purchasing a gift for a parent, not so much. So there's um, the real test in my mind is does it benefit the individual? Um, it's okay if there's an ancillary benefit to other people as well, but the real thrust of the expense needs to be for that individual. And Kathleen, that's how do you, how, I'm sorry, how do you, um, how do you account for that? Like, do you have to report on and, and say that, you know, the money that was taken out um, was used for X, Y, and Z? Kathleen, can I do this one? Because I'm going to say what you probably can't. Sure. Okay. Uh, don't overthink this. If you can justify it in your head, you're almost certainly good to go. Um, you know, so actually this is funny. The only example I've ever run across was uh, a church who was a rep payee. So they were responsible for the individual's money, wanted to build a gazebo. Last time I gave this example on a presentation, that church was actually on the call. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> but, but they agreed with me, right? So, so that is the only example, right, where um, I can see. But, you know, again, if you can justify it to yourself, I have not heard of anyone ever getting questioned. I'm not saying you can't. I'm not saying you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, there are companies that have better track of receipts I encourage you to not overthink this. Again, I'm not the attorney, so that's why I'm taking over this. If you can justify it for the individual, that's good. A gazebo, really, I mean, for the church, that, that's really not for the benefit in the individual. Maybe if that individual was, you know, in a wheelchair and the only one, a ramp. But really, the church just wanted a gazebo anyway. Um, so really just... You know, if, if you can justify it in your head, you're good. I find people, and the reason I jumped in is I find we can spend a half hour going this game. And sometimes I play the game, try to think of an expense that's not covered. It's really hard. But again, given for the sake of time, I just wanted to jump in there. Thank you. Um, can you jump back to the prior slide, please? So oh, that, that was... Uh, thank you. I uh, have started to say that there's two reasons that uh, I, don't, I don't really recommend that other people use an ABLE account, meaning mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, um, if they want to contribute um, sizable funds to an individual, those should really be put into a third party special needs trust, um, not only because of the contribution limits, but also because of a payback provision. So when the person with the disability, their account terminates when they pass away. And at that point in time, if they've received state benefits, um, then the state of Connecticut or any state where you receive benefits is the first beneficiary of the remaining funds. Meaning that even if you want your sister or um, friend to receive the remaining funds, Connecticut gets paid back first. Um, one of the reasons why I specify state funds is because a lot of people are worried about Social Security. There's no payback for Social Security. That's a strictly federal benefit that does not require repayment. So I always like to make that, um, that clear. All right, we can jump, jump. I have a question, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. So um, when you say state, state being paid back first, what are you talking about? Like, if there are any outstanding or let's say overpayments that the, the state paid you, is that what you're talking about? So if somebody, let's say, is uh, receiving services through the autism waiver or DDS services, um, those services cost money, it costs the state money. And even though you're not paying for them during your lifetime, 
the state is keeping track of all of the hours and services that they're providing and the cost of those services. So when the person passes away, the state is going to present a bill and say, all right, we allowed you to keep this money um, and still access benefits during your lifetime, but now because you have some left over, we think that we deserve it first. And a third party special needs trust does not have that payback. When, when you're doing inheritance and gift planning, that's, that's why you wanna make sure that that money is protected in the right vehicle because the state really shouldn't have an interest in money from other people. They don't have a legal right to that. So they'd be able to tap into the ABLE account? Correct, right. Wow, okay. Legally, they're the first beneficiary. So the Department of Treasury, oh, okay. um, you know, I haven't encountered this, if, you know, it's so early, but I'm assuming the Department of Treasury has some sort of reporting obligation to the Department of Administrative Services in whatever state to notify them of the death. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> So I, I kind of touched upon this before. I, I just wanted to get Andrew's thoughts because Andrew's done a lot of work in terms of comparing different programs. So if he has any recommendations, I, I did mention Ohio um, and, and I know Andrew has some fondness for Massachusetts as well. Um, so I would say that, so Connecticut did select, it's called the ABLE Alliance. A lot of states have partnered together to have a very similar program. Um, Nothing special about Connecticut, and I'm not even referring to the ABLE account program. Uh, so what I mean by that is don't wait on Connecticut. Chances are if when Connecticut does do their ABLE account program, it probably won't be that good. We're in Connecticut after all. Uh, and the other states still might be better. So it, it, again, it might be a good option. There might be tax incentives. It's worth considering but it's nothing to wait for, okay? So I really wanna stress that. Do not wait to open one because you're waiting on Connecticut, okay? Just to jump uh, before Andrew moves on, if you do wanna jump in on Connecticut's program, if it ends up being just blows everybody's mind, you can roll over an ABLE account from another state to Connecticut. So you're not precluded from doing that if that's what you choose to do. Correct. And uh, so I would, again, go ahead and do it. I really say there's two options. Fidelity, Massachusetts, is the only one available in Connecticut that has no fee for a debit card, no fee to open, and no maintenance fee. Remember that Bank of America example, right? Carmina does Bank of America, I can tell. No, I'm just kidding. Um, she does. No, 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 no. no. Okay. <laughs> So, but, <laughs> so um, you know, Fidelity, Massachusetts, if you want to put in $100 and you don't want to put in any more, they're not going to charge you. The negative there, and there are a couple others, is that it's not as easy to spend the money. You have to transfer it to a separate account, then spend it from the debit card. With Ohio, they, keep, they have a really great system for keeping track of expenses. Uh, some of their investment fees are a little lower, but they do have maintenance fees for lower balances. So if you only wanted to put $100 and you didn't know if you were ever going to put in more money, well, a $30 a year fee really kind of negates that $100 that you're putting in. However, if you're looking to spend the money on the ABLE for you know, gas or food you know, once or twice a week, you know, Ohio can really make a lot more sense. It makes it a lot easier to spend the money. But that goes both ways. I was talking to someone last week who spent money too quickly and, you know, ha needing to wait that extra day or two or to think about transferring money before spending it is a positive. So, again, back to, you know, saving and thinking about the purchases. So it, it really all depends. Those are the two I recommend. Um, so, and I, there are other reasons to have other ones. You don't go through a bank or a financial advisor, um, which I know is ironic given I'm giving the presentation, 
but I am happy to help anyone. So is Kathleen. I think I kind of just volunteered her. Um, if you have questions on ABLE accounts, uh, we can walk you through it. Um, I want to also yeah. mention, um, I know that there's, we, we look at different websites. I, I like the ABLE National Resource Center um, to be able to compare different features of states. Andrew has a site that um, I know he's fond of more. I mean, so. my website. Oh, yeah. That, yes. So actually, so I, we have a blog post um, and it actually, and Kathleen and I are updating it. So, but, and nothing's really changed, but we're still updating it. <laughs> and, and we break down some of the, let's call it top options in Connecticut. Really, it's low balance. Don't think you're going to spend the money, Massachusetts. Higher balances and or going to spend the money, Ohio. It's not quite that simple, but it's pretty close. So I love, um, I see it, that there's, I'm sorry, Andrew, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, oh and I, it, Carmen, I could give you the, the link, you know, for on my website, yeah. the blog post. Um, and mm -hmm. Kathleen, if you want to send our brochure, the PDF, we have a one page uh, PDF on ABLE accounts that has the link to the oh, blog as okay. well. I will do um, that. Yeah, that would be great because I'll share it with everybody that's on the call. Perfect. I, I don't know if Emily is still on the call. I see, um, I think her parents are. Emily put a comment yes. about her ABLE account. And I know I had the opportunity to speak with Emily um, briefly about her ABLE account. But Emily, what state is yours with if you're on the call and how have you found that? I don't see her on the call, but I th thought her parents, her parents are. Something Emily was there. on she was. She was on, yes. She okay. was on, by, right. but I think her her dad. Yeah, that's okay. If we can get him. Are there any other um, questions? I think on our very last slide, I put both of our contact information. If you want to follow up with us by email or phone, um, or if you have any questions now. You guys are amazing. You Thank you. You're you great, really great tag team. Really, really and uh, funny, too. <laughs> Thank you. I think Al just asked a question. How should we handle the $1,200 coronavirus payment in view of the $1,600 and unemployment. monthly cap? Um, how should we be documenting spending? So the coronavirus payment um, is this is one of those things where it's exempt, I believe for a certain period of time, meaning it doesn't count towards your um, eligibility for um, social security, SSI or Medicaid. But from a practical perspective, I just don't know why people, I don't, I don't know if a state agency is going to process or remember or look at things correctly. So I typically say, just try to keep yourself under a $1,600 asset limit for Medicaid and put that um, check into the ABLE account um, just to be safe, but it is exempt um, for a certain period of time. And if you want to email me, I can give you the exact period of time um, later on. You're welcome. So, when you do put money into the ABLE account, you had talked about Vanguard and Fidelity, do they invest that money that you, do you have a yes. choice of where you want it to be invested or? Yes, so you have a choice of where you want it to be invested. Um, you know, it can be in a savings equivalent, you know, earn some interest, um, you know, like a bank, or it's invested in, you know, six or so different investment options that, um, blog post I have because a little comparison. If you don't know what to do, they can, you know, just pick and kind of do it for you. Um, one caveat is you can only change those investments twice a year too. You're probably not going to change them really. Um, but just so you know that you it, an able account really is long term, you know, it's not something where you're really, you know, investing in stocks and you know, buying and trading and moving things around a lot. It's designed to be, you know, simple. So there's a few different options, you know, 
um, more risk, more reward, you know, and there's so there's conservative or aggressive. Um, there's also a conservative and liberal option as well. Okay, that's my last bad joke. Um, so. <laughs> Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> what? What was that? He said, I hope the video recording got all my head takes. <laughs> I, I think it, I and even noticed too. them. So they were big, right? Yeah. <laughs> but thank you again, um, Carmina um, and Nancy, for having us. Because this was just, we really appreciate the opportunity to share information. Um, and like we said, we're here as, as resources. We want people to feel like they know their options and to not feel worried or nervous about getting the information that you need. So please reach out to us. We'd love to help. Um, I do Absolutely. have a question. If you can share with um, Carmina, um, like, what your, like what your fees are, you know, um, that would be great. Then we can put it out there to families and if it's something that's doable and in their budget, like to hire you both, you know, as so, an attorney and as a financial planner. So I'll speak for very generally. I, I like to say that my fee is, you know, it depends on how much I like you, um, which is, <laughs> but no, no, it all here and it's, it's semi true. Um, you know, so, you know, I will offer, I'm an ABLE ambassador for 2020. If you have a simple question that I can answer via email, right, you know, like, and it's not every day all the time. If you email me, I'm, I'm going to be happy to email, you know, and reply back. If you have a quick question on an ABLE account, I, I want to help as many people open them as possible. Um, and how I'm, you know, pay, compensate, again, it's a, it's a little more, you know, uh, complicated if it's something beyond that. Um, and I would say that both of us really try to, you know, um, we're not Santa Claus, but we, we also try to make things as, you know, reasonable and affordable um, as possible. But I'll let Kathleen speak. Yeah, so um, when, the way that my practice works is that we always start with an initial consultation and right now that's just like this on a virtual platform um, and we send out a client planning profile which basically tries to give us a snapshot of your planning goals of your financial picture because underlying my work is generally estate planning which includes the financial piece of things um, and um, some family demographics, things like that. So our initial meeting is typically an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. I have a consult fee of 350. Um, Andrew sometimes is part of that. Um, if it makes sense and you, especially for people that have seen our presentation, if you want us to do a joint consultation, we will. Andrew doesn't charge a separate consult fee to be part of that. Um, so from there, that's when we kind of figure out what the plan is. And those legal fees just range depending on what the particular needs are. So I can't really give a good ballpark on that. No, I think that's, one I think one that's thing helpful. I do want to add that I, I do do that's a little unique is um, I, I can offer, you know, monthly, you know, budgeting, uh, you know, as more like a subscription service that we talked about canceling. Um, you know, for some money management with some, you know, individuals. And, you know, if, if a parent or someone else wanted to, you know, pay for that for me to engage for, you know, just being on, um, you know, essentially like on call for just more ongoing questions where there's more, you know, what should I do about this or this? And you're going to get so much time from me a month. I, uh, as someone with a disability who, you know, is passionate about this, I, I really enjoy doing that uh, quite a bit. So you can definitely reach out to, you know, us for that as well. And that's separate than what I consider the, the main financial planning, um, you know, that we do. So. Thank you. I think that's really helpful because, um, you know, many of our families obviously are on tight budgets as are individuals with disabilities, but 
you know, if, if they get exposed to like this presentation, right? But need a little bit more in depth, like as you said, Kathleen, the financial profile, you know, taking a look at that and all of that, that could help them. And then, you know, they could pay you for that because that's affordable. And then come back to you and pay you for services that they need when they have the, you know, the funds available to do that. I um, love getting paid twice. So <laughs> important I'm just for saying. Me to Thank say you. Also, is I'm always very, um, I hope transparent, and genuine. That's my that's my goal um, in life. Um, and for me, it's never a pressure situation, so I don't ever want anybody to feel. Um, like having an initial meeting is obligating them to anything more than that meeting. Everybody's in a different place in terms of the information that they're looking for and the planning that they need to do and in the timeline in which they want to do it. So having one conversation um, truly and genuinely is all a family may need um, and in their perspective at that time. So um, just that message is important to, to, I think, both Andrew and I that we want, we're here to, to share information freely, first and foremost, um, and enjoy doing it, as I think you can tell with Andrew's comedic <laughs> display. <laughs> I'd like to have you guys back down just because. <laughs> Imagine what we're like in person, <laughs> right? I know. I can take him and elbow him in person. <laughs> The, the 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 social distancing is a lot better. She doesn't. She's not able to kick me under the table uh, anymore. See. More poking and kicking. That's good. Yes. <laughs> no, but truly, we thank you guys so much. This was really an eye opener, um, and I know a lot of people. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, I know your social security number. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so so much. So so you owe me like months. Of free consultation. <laughs> of, of, uh, you know what? We I'll, I'll point you in the direction of free identity theft monitoring. How's that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> we all learned my social security number. <laughs> But no, seriously. But thank you so much. Really. Does anybody have any other questions for Kathleen and Andrew? No. 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 Um, but yeah, truly, we've learned so much. We had laughs. We appreciate it. Um, and I will edit this video, this recording. <laughs> no! And, uh, <laughs> and I'll be sure to send it to um, everybody that has registered and is on. And with your the, the brochure that you're going to send me and the links, I'll add that in there also. Yep. Okay, good. And I'll put your contacts, you know, all that is in there. I guess is on your brochure, so. Um, but yeah, thank you so, so much. And don't be surprised. I'm sure we will contact you guys again. Um, Absolutely. You. We learned, I mean, we've learned so much. This is the third sure session. Have. Yeah. We really have learned so, so much. Yeah. And the, you know, the, the beauty of it is that right now, um, many of our kids, you know, speaking for us as a team are kind of in, you know, at that age where they're beginning to think about planning and, and we're beginning to think about securing their future financially because we're not going to be here forever. Mm -hmm. um, and even the ones who have younger kids, this is good practice for them to start to set them up to start thinking about it. Great. Very true. Very true. But yes, I see there's a thank you in the chat here um, to you guys and to Eileen. Um, so yeah, again, I thank everybody. So Thank Stay you. in touch. If you have any questions, reach out to us, and I'm sure we'll be talking to both of you guys again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank have you. a great night. Thank Thank you. And if you have any connections that Nancy and I can come down there, ring the bell, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Bye. All right. <laughs> we'll see you. Thank you.